The scriptures teach that God has set term limits on Christ's reign as king. Hmm. I wonder if he can limit Joe Biden to one term. A frequent commenter on my videos, known as Moonshade, says that this teaching that the reign of Christ will come to an end is silly. Jesus never stops reigning. That would be silly to say that. Sorry, Moonshade. Jesus will eventually give up his kingdom. Now, I am once and for all going to put an end to this debate regarding the duration of Jesus' reign as king. No one will ever debate this subject again. <laughs> Jesus will rule over all except God. And one day his reign will come to a completely successful end. Why will it end, you may ask? That's a good question. Because he will successfully lead all of creation to the promised land of the scriptures which is God being all in all. And you, no matter who you are or what you've done, will be a valuable part of the all that God will be all in. When God is finally and fully all in all, there will be no more need for kings or mediators or anything between God and his creation, including Christ as king, because God will be all in all. Right now, we look forward to Jesus reigning over all things as the good king. In the distant future, we will look back upon his reign as the former king with great appreciation and thankfulness for all that he did as king. We will look back on a job not well done, but perfectly done. In the distant future, Jesus will be a successful former king. There will come a time when Jesus will give over the kingdom the successful and perfected kingdom to his father and his God. He will do this because there will be nothing left to rule and reign over, having perfected all of God's creation. Instead of people appreciating just how damn good Jesus is at everything that he does, including ruling and reigning, they deny his work and attempt to diminish his great accomplishments. The scriptures say he's the savior of the world. Yeah, but he doesn't really save the world. No, he doesn't. The scriptures say he took away the sin of the world. Yeah, but he didn't really take away the sin of the world. No, he didn't. The scriptures say that he will abolish Satan's acts. Yeah, but he's not going to abolish all of Satan's acts. Yeah, he'll leave a lot of stuff undone. Yeah, he will. The scriptures teach that his reign will be so damn successful that he will not have to reign forever and ever. Yeah, but he'll have to reign forever, and ever, and ever. The scriptures teach that his judgments will be done in righteousness, and he will bring about the good purposes and benefits of judgment for all. Yeah, most of those people he judges, they'll burn in hell forever, and ever, and ever. All right, Mr. Naysayer. Can we see what the scriptures say about this? Huh? Please. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 through 28 reveals to us the culminating acts of Christ's reign and his final giving up of the kingdom to his God and Father. For since, in fact, through a man came death, through a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. For even as in Adam all are dying, thus also in Christ shall all be vivified, yet each in his own class. The first fruit Christ, thereupon those who are Christ in his presence, thereafter the consummation, whenever he may be giving up the kingdom to his God and Father, whenever he should be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. For he must be reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy is being abolished death for he subjects all under his feet now whenever he may be saying that all is subject it is evident that it is outside of him who subjects all to him now whenever all may be subjected to him then the son himself also shall be subjected to him who subjects all to him that god may be all in all this powerful passage reveals tremendous truths of God and Christ's ultimate victory over sin and death and all enemies. Verse 22 says clearly that all will be vivified, which means made immortal, just as Christ was vivified, made immortal. 
The last class will be vivified at the consummation, at the end of the new heaven and new earth eon. Verses 24 through 28 reveal some of the key events that will take place at the consummation of the eons, along with the final vivification and immortalization of the rest of humanity, who were not previously vivified in the presence of Christ. After the final class is vivified at the consummation, all of mankind will be immortal and incorruptible. Verse 24 tells us that Christ gives up the kingdom to his God and Father. When Jesus gives up the kingdom to his God and Father, he will no longer have a kingdom to rule over. He would be a king with no kingdom. But because his reign is successful, he hands the perfectly completed kingdom over to his God and Father. Verse 24 also tells us that Christ will be nullifying all sovereignty and all authority and power. No one else will be ruling and reigning after this. All other reigns within God's creation will come to an end. Verse 25 tells us that he must be reigning until he reigning until he reigning until he should be placing all his enemies under his feet. He will do this successfully. Verse 26, the last enemy is being abolished, death. Notice that during his reign, he eventually gets to the last enemy, death, meaning he has subjected all other enemies and put them under his feet. Verse 27 tells us that God subjects all under Christ's feet. Verse 28 tells us, Then the Son himself also shall be subjected to his Father. Jesus has always been subjected to God, his Father. This is a deeper level of subjection so that God will be all in all, with Jesus being included with us in the all that God is in. And finally, at the end of verse 28, God being all in all is the farthest future event revealed in the scriptures, far beyond the end of the book of Revelation. What happens after God becomes all in all? I don't know. No one does. God has not revealed that to us. But I know it's going to be quite full of awesome. Try to imagine, if you can, the greatness and awesomeness of the ceremony of Christ handing the completed perfected kingdom over to his Father. What a ceremony that will be. I'll be there, and you'll be there. I'm thinking and hoping that Jesus will reuse one of his most popular and powerful sayings. It is finished. Also, Christ roles as mediator between God and man, as savior of the world and reconciler of all creation, abolisher of Satan's acts, and the judge of all will end in complete success also. There will be no more need for Christ to mediate between God and man when God and man are fully at peace with one another. This is how God will be all in all and at peace with all of his creation. There will be no more need for Christ to save anyone after all are saved. There will be no more need for Christ to abolish the acts of the adversary after he has abolished all of the acts of the adversary. And there will be no more need for Christ to judge after all of his judgments have accomplished their beneficial purpose for the judge and the judged. Some watching this probably believe that God and Christ will be battling sin, rebellion, and death forever and ever and ever. Those who claim that his reign as king must be everlasting deny the scriptures and in essence are ignorantly diminishing the ability of Christ. If you believe that Christ must reign forever and ever, please let me know why in the comments and please use scripture to support your comment. Thank you. Now let's take a look at some passages that reveal the term limits of Christ's reign as well as those who rule and reign with him. In Luke 1, 32 through 33, we read the words from the angel Gabriel to Mary before the birth of Christ. He shall be great, and son of the Most High shall he be called. And the Lord God shall be giving him the throne of David, his father, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob for the eon. And of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. Gabriel is telling Mary that Jesus will be the king over Israel, over the house of Jacob, for the eons. Now this is speaking of eons four and five, the good eons that are yet to come. We are currently in the wicked eon, eon three. This reveals to us the God-given term limit of the reign of Jesus over the house of Jacob. In the last sentence, and of his kingdom there shall be no consummation. His reign ends, but what Christ establishes and hands over to his Father will never end. It will be enduring forever. 
and ever. It is called a kingdom even when it is given up to the Father by a figure of speech called retention. That is where at the transition of something it retains what it was called previously even though it is not still literally true. In other words, it will no longer be a kingdom with Christ as king because his reign comes to an end. We can see another probably clearer example of retention in Revelation 20, 12 through 13. And I perceived the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. And scrolls were opened, and another scroll was opened, which is the scroll of life. And the dead were judged by that which is written in the scrolls in accord with their acts. And the sea gives up the dead in it, and death and the unseen give up the dead in them. And they were condemned, each in accord with their acts. These two verses are talking about living people, but they are still called the dead by the figure of speech called retention, because immediately prior to this, they were the dead. So even though they are now alive, they retain the description of who they are as the dead. Another passage that reveals the term limits of Christ's reign is in Revelation 11:15 from the Concordant Literal New Testament. And the seventh messenger trumpets and loud voices occurred in heaven, saying, The kingdom of this world became our Lord's and his Christ, and he shall be reigning for the eons of the eons. Amen. This tells us that the reign of Christ will be for the eons of the eons. This is speaking of the final two eons out of the five eons in full. So two plural eons within five plural eons, the eons of the eons. Contrast this with the King James Version translation of Revelation 11.15 and you'll see why there's so much confusion and why there's so much resistance to Christ's reign actually ending. And the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. The phrase forever and ever obviously lends to the idea of an everlasting reign of Christ, but that is not what this verse says. Even within the Greek, it is speaking of the ions of the ions. Forever and ever is a horrible mistranslation that leads to a false conclusion concerning the reign of Christ. Here we see the term limits placed on the reign of those who are offering divine service to God, Revelation 22.5. And night shall be no more, and they have no need of lamplight and sunlight, for the Lord God shall be illuminating them, and they shall be reigning for the eons of the eons. The reign of God's servants is the same as the reign of Christ from Revelation 11.15, for the eons of the eons. What does this phrase for the eons of the eons mean? The eons of the eons are the final two eons of the five eons that were created by God through Christ according to Hebrews chapter 1. We are currently in eon 3 which is called the present wicked eon. The eons of the eons are the upcoming two good eons where God and Christ will be magnified and glorified as they deserve. These will be the two eons in which Christ and his servants reign. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 28 speaks of Christ's subjection of all. Let's take a look at the power of Christ to subject all. First, I want us to have this powerful truth in the front seat of our minds as we look at some passages regarding Christ's power to subject all. In Matthew 28, 18, we have the words of Christ to his followers just before he ascended back into heaven after his resurrection. And approaching, Jesus speaks to them saying, Given to me was all authority in heaven and on the earth. Do you think he can get the job done? Yeah. 1 Peter 3:22. Jesus Christ is at God's right hand, being gone into heaven, messengers and authorities and powers being subjected to him. Philippians 3:20 20 through 21. For our realm is inherent in the heavens, out of which we are awaiting a Savior, also the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfigure the body of our humiliation to conform it to the body of his glory, in accord with the operation which enables him even to subject all to himself. We see clearly that Christ has been given the authority and the power to subject all to himself. All are not yet subject to him, but all will be in God's time. Christ is currently doing his work of subjecting, but all are not currently subjected to him. But in God's time, at the consummation, 
all will be subjected to him. Romans 10.3 For they, stubborn Israel, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, were not subjected to the righteousness of God. Stubborn Israel and really stubborn humanity and those who are stubborn throughout God's creation are not subjected to the righteousness of God currently. But because Christ and God will successfully subject all properly and in line with God's will and intention, all will eventually be subjected to the righteousness of God. And they will have the righteousness of God being subjected to it. We can see in Hebrews 2, 5-9 through 9, that God subjects all things on the earth to man, with Christ being the head of humanity. But not all things on the earth are fully subjected to him. For not to messengers does he subject the impending inhabited earth concerning which we are speaking. Yet somewhere someone certifies, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? or a son of mankind, that thou art visiting him. Thou makest him some bit inferior to messengers, with glory and honor thou wreathest him, and dost place him over the works of thy hands. All dost thou subject underneath his feet. For in the subjection of all to him, he leaves nothing unsubject to him. Yet now we are not as yet seeing all subject to him. Yet we are observing Jesus, who has been made some bit inferior to messengers, because of the suffering of death, wreathed with glory and honor, so that in the grace of God he should be tasting death for the sake of everyone. Verse 8 tells us that God has subjected everything underneath the feet of man on the earth. For in subjection of all to him, he leaves nothing unsubject to him. Yet now we are not as yet seeing all subject to him. But Christ, as the head of humanity, will, in God's time, subject all to himself and to God. And this successful subjection will lead to the completed kingdom that will be given by Christ to his Father. Jesus successfully completed all of the first phase of his mission, and he secured the salvation of all by his death. Once Christ's part was completed, his act of obedience unto death, it was now up to his father to rouse him from the dead, proving that his death was successful in accomplishing its purpose. In the same way, Jesus does his job as the good king, reigning for the eons of the eons. Then he hands the completed kingdom over to his God and Father, and his Father takes over from there as the all in all. I hope that this video has helped you see the glorious consummation of the successful reign of Christ, the good King, and that he will not have to be reigning forever and ever and ever over a creation that he just cannot subject to God. I hope that you will realize that God and Christ will not forever be battling their enemies. And please, no matter who you are or what you've done, realize that you will be part of the all that God will be all in all in. To see how Christ abolishes death and that those cast into the lake of fire will not be there forever, I invite you to watch this video next.